All right, so can you please give a very, very warm Melbourne and Mildura and Victorian welcome to Brian and Candace Simmons, please. Good. We'll do a duet. Good morning. I'm just going to... Afternoon. afternoon. <laughs> I'm still on U.S. time, I think. So anyway, I just want to say hi, and we're going to get him going right away because I want to hear what he has to say. But uh, it's going to be glorious. I had a dream last night about just a gl marvelous glory explosion. So I think he's going to teach on the glory, which... Wow, just you wait. So, But we just want to greet you and tell you how uh, privileged we feel to be here in Australia. And thank you for all of the work that you've done all over this, uh, this continent. We just thank you as we go to different churches. We are just we're fed by the people that we come in contact with. So we just know that we know that revival is imminent here, and it's going to start here in Australia first. So we want to get the overflow of what you have. And uh, we're just seeing a hungry people everywhere we go, and we absolutely love being with hungry people. So God's going to do a major ex glory explosion, not just here, but all through this continent. And we're so glad uh, that we know you, and we, can, we go back and just brag on you. At home, we do. And you say, we need to be more like Australia. They get upset. Well, they, well, all, the, but, you know, all the gringos We, in we can't help it. What's true is true, right? Uh, so uh, anyway, so we love you all. And I'm going to share maybe a little bit later. But we want to get started this morning with this uh, anointed man. I get the overflow. I'm spoiled. I get to be with him all the time. I never tire of hearing the new things because it's always new revelation that he brings. So uh, I'll just take all the new revelation I can get. So why don't you just extend your hand to him. I'm going to just say let's just pray for him that he will just give us the whole bail. Uh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Just pour out through him, Lord. We thank you for all the deposits that you placed in him, Lord. Even last night, new stuff. Lord Jesus, let it just rip, Father. Let it just roll over us, Lord Jesus. We want to capture your heart through this uh, wonderful vessel, Lord, pour into us. Lord Jesus, we just want more of you. So let it just come, Lord. Let it come with all of its fullness, Lord, out of his mouth into our hearts, Lord. Thank you for what you've done through, in and through him, and bless him this morning in Jesus' name. This afternoon. Amen. And amen. This afternoon. I'll wake up soon. <laughs> Thank you, darling princess, beloved of my heart. 44 years of marital bliss. Well, 43. The first was kind of a throwaway year, but uh, that's common. But we've, we've had a tremendous... Uh, we, we, we send blessings to you from our family. We have um, six grandchildren, which means we had to have children. So we have three children, six grandkids, and actually two greats. Yeah, two great-granddaughters, which is really amazing because I'm only 40. So that's just fascinating how God works things, you know, miraculous well, um, what a wonderful time to be with you, and thank you for giving up a Saturday, uh, Friday, Thursday, yeah, <laughs> Thursday morning, no, I know, it's afternoon. Thanks for coming, all right, and uh, you, you're going to be blessed, not because I'm here, but because Espiritu Santo is here. Song Yong Nim, if you're Korean. What is it in Chinese? No, it's Holy Spirit. Oh, Song Yong Yong. Okay. Holy Ghost is here. All right. We got a lot to talk about, so I'm going to kick it right in gear. Father, I pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to fall upon us like dew from heaven. Let it soften, tenderize our hearts. Help us, Lord, to be people that are ready to learn, which means we can unlearn. Uh, Lord, we forsake our opinions. They're worthless. We forsake all of our traditions. They have not helped us. We want truth. We want raw, undiluted, fresh, right out of the can, revelation from heaven. So speak deeply into our hearts, deep crying out for deep. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
All right, just uh, uh, by way of introduction, I, I've not had the pleasure of meeting all of you, although I see friends and uh, familiar faces. Uh, we were at uh, Stairway a while back at, um, what was it, Empowered Pastors, and I think we met some of you there. Uh, it's not our first time in Melbourne. We have been at Hillview Church as well, Hope City Church, and I, I see uh, Pastor Sarah Morgan, she and her husband Gary, pastor here in the city, and uh, it's, it's a treat for us. We love Melbourne. And I do believe, like my wife hinted at, that the great south land of the Holy Spirit is primed and ready for the next awakening that's coming to the nations. And we're asked wherever we go, we're asked, where is revival going to break out? And uh, everybody thinks it's them, you know. Everybody has the strongest demons, the most witchcraft, and they're the ones going to have revival. Wherever we go, it's the same story. But I like to tell people that it is going to be in Australia where the great... Third Awakening is birthed, and I believe that something could happen today. I believe that with all my heart. I have enough faith for everybody in the room. I have enough faith for the people of this city. So I don't know why I have more faith than you, because you live here. But God has brought us here, uh, we believe, to make a deposit. And, of course, tonight we'll have a, a no another wonderful uh, time together uh, with the rest of uh, folks coming in later. But um, there are three... <coughs> There are three things the Lord has, has done uh, in, with my wife and I. We, uh, we were saved in the Jesus movement, early 70s in America, and we immediately, um, after a long engagement of three weeks, we got married and we committed, that was supposed to be a joke, uh, we committed to go into the tribal areas, indigenous people groups where the gospel had never gone. So in the early 70s, we took Bible training and boot camp and I was uh, a linguist, I took linguistic training. And then we went into the jungle of Central South America, right on the border of Colombia and Panama. And our mission was to plant churches and to uh, break the language down. The language had never been written. It was an unwritten language, and uh, they had never read anything. They were illiterate, of course, and, and we were, uh, as a linguist, I was part of a team to help the final um, grammar and phonemical structure of the language and to get a, uh, you know, work through the tagmemics and the pedagogical grammar uh, to set in place so that other people could learn that language, and that was our role, and, of course, to translate. But how do you learn a language that's never been written? I mean, mate, come on, that, that's... Like there's no Rosetta Stone, there's no, uh, there's no teacher to help us. I mean, it's all you could do is point. You know, I, first day in the village, I point to a tree and I say, what's that? And they gave me the word. I wrote down, I got a word for tree, praise God. Uh, my first word in the Payakuna language. And I pointed to a big rock, a boulder, and I went over and touched it. I said, what's that? They gave me my second word. Woo! And a cloud went over and I pointed and I thought I would get cloud, sky, you know, something similar, so, uh, or shade, you know. So I got my third word, and I wrote it all down phonetically, and as I looked at it carefully, it was the same word. Every time I pointed and said, what's that? They said, your finger, stupid. <laughs> they don't point with their finger. They use their lips. So I got my first language and cultural lesson really quick. You know, you carry your Western mindset over into an tr indigenous tribe, and it's just not what you think. And that began a total discovery of uh, cross-cultural communications, of, of really embracing and, and assimilating who they were, not expecting them to become like me, but Candace and myself becoming like them. We ate what they ate. We, you know, monkey, turtle, iguana, and, and other stuff. And... Uh, we ate bananas and rice, and then we'd switch it around the next day and have uh, rice and bananas. And uh, so we lived virtually in the dirt, in, the, in a hut there uh, with the uh, Kuna people, and, and uh, we're so thrilled when the Spirit of the Lord came, swept over the village, and a mighty move of the Holy Spirit, and virtually it seemed as though everyone had come to know the Lord. And now there is a healthy church, there is godly leaders, they uh, teach, preach in their language, and they have a New Testament that I had a small part in helping uh, get, get out. So we're thankful for that. The second uh, ministry thing that God called us to, I, I had an audible voice speak to me at 5 in the morning. This was uh, uh, mid-80s. And the Lord commissioned us to come back to North America and said, um, revival's coming to the nations. You're going to be a part of it. 
And he made some promises to me. He said that I, he said audibly, it's the only time it's ever happened to me, I heard the audible voice. God says, I have a word for you to bring to the nations. And for years, I have pondered and prayed, what's the word? And I just realized, like a year ago, five years into translating the Passion Translation, I have a word for you to bring to the nations. I'm, t I'm like brain dead male, I guess. I did not understand. <laughs> See, when God speaks, there's always, he's, he always speaks in a way that the casual are not going to understand, the superficial are not going to get it. He's, there's always embedded in every word he speaks revelation truth that's greater than what we understand. So we came back and started a beautiful church near Yale University. You ever hear of that? Uh, outside of New York City in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. And actually, Sarah and uh, Gary were there uh, uh, before they were even married. I don't think you were even dating then, were you? You were not there. You were 17. And, and hubby, uh, well, he was there. And, and it's so cool to, to see the Lord bring two beautiful people that we know and love and to see how the Lord brought them together. Anyway, awesome. And their, their son, it's just uh, it's a warm fuzzy having you here. Good to see you as well, Kimberly. Amen. Um, so we started the church, and it flourished, and it grew way beyond our expectations in a place where uh, people said, you can't have a Holy Spirit. We're very dignified. We're very conservative. We don't express ourselves in that way here in New England, Connecticut. I said, well, let's just see what Jehovah Surprise You is going to do. <laughs> And the church just kind of blew up in a good way. We caught the wind of the Toronto outpouring throughout the 90s, and uh, we had thousands and thousands of people coming through our renewal meetings. And then uh, uh, the Lord, through miracles, we were able to buy a campus and, and quite a large uh, facility, and, and the church grew past a couple of thousand people. And, and right when things are going great, you know, pastor's dream, people are coming. They, we had traffic jams. We had to have police around our building because of traffic uh, coming in and out. And it was just massive. We had three services. Our sanctuary seated about 1,300 people. And, and right when things are going really well, Jehovah surprised you. <laughs> spoke again. Not audibly, but he spoke and said, turn it over. Let another generation have the church. So we did that. And our son-in-law and daughter, he's a brilliant man. He married our daughter. Uh, <coughs> he, uh, you, know, you know what, that's me, what that means. Uh, uh, so... Um, they took the church, and uh, for years they've pastored there, and, and uh, we're just so grateful for Gateway, our, our home church. But um, have to, after turning the church over, uh, I said, Lord, what do you want us to do? And I had a strange thing rise up in my heart. I felt like I was supposed to translate the Bible. That's weird. I mean, who does that? Um, I said, Lord, if this is really you, this is either you or a bad joke. And if it's really you, speak to me or even speak to my wife because I don't always hear as clearly as she does. She uh, gets seven dreams every night. Uh, she did last night. She will tonight. She will tomorrow night. And it's just phenomenal. She'll share some more uh, during the day here, some of the revelation that she got about you all. So we, we know a little bit about you before we even came uh, because of that. How many of you know God speaks? We don't serve a mute God. He's capable of speaking. He has a way to get through to us. Job 33 says he speaks first one way, then another. He has a multiple, uh, uh, he has uh, all kinds of abilities to speak and get our attention. So I said, Lord, make it clear. Well, he did not speak to us. He walked through my room. He walked through the wall of my room. And he breathed on me. And he says, I want you to do this project and promise me a number of things that are coming to pass. Uh, how many of you know if he says it, it's done? And uh, he promised that he would uh, give me secrets that had not been disclosed. And I know that sounds, I know how it sounds, but I'm telling the truth, so I'm not going to apologize for it. Um, and he also promised me that I would be persecuted, which is really cool. <laughs> it makes you godly. You know, it's the best, it's the the fastest way to mature in Christ is a good dose of rejection and persecution. It just has a way of you get over your character issues and you, you bless those who will speak evil of you. 
So uh, I'm here to share some of those secrets with you today. And uh, if you know it all, you're in the wrong meeting. Uh, if you're a know-it-all and you have all knowledge and can prophesy all things and you have the tongues of every angel and you can move mountains with your faith, then you should take the microphone. <laughs> but uh, I don't know much, but the secrets of the Lord, he's beginning to share them with me, and I'd like to share them with you. Is that all right? That we, we have a, a time together, and we'll take a break in just a few minutes, but I want to kind of uh, warm it up a little bit. Um, there are three... <coughs> There are three, oh, I know what I was going to do. I was going to give away some books. Um, Romans, the book of Romans is so amazing. I mean, I love Romans. I've always loved Romans. It's, it's just a fascinating, uh, it's a masterpiece of Paul. There's a story behind this, this book right here. This is, um, I will just, I'm, I will make this as uh, uh, discreet as I can, but God really helped me with this translation, with Romans in particular. I'll just, I'll leave it at that. I'm mega understating it. God really helped me do this translation. And I've had least, I've had less revisions and I've had to go back and correct less things than any other work that I've done. But uh, uh, do you have this, John? This is uh, the stairway and it's about Jacob's ladder. It's really about uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, faith. Jacob, transformation. Isaac, inheritance. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the stairway, the ladder going up into heaven, and angels going on that ladder, you're the angel going up because we ascend and descend. If these were angels from heaven, they would descend and ascend. You guys understanding this? You with me? These are uh, angels, uh, the word malach in the Bible, the Hebrew, and uh, uh, angelos, almost like Spanish and Greek. The, both Hebrew and Greek, it's very interesting that two languages would have this characteristic, but both Hebrew and Greek, the word for angel, can be human. Half of the time in the Bible, angels are mentioned. It's people. It's people. This will help you unlock the scriptures. So these are not angels from heaven on the ladder. It's men and women of the last days going up, getting their mandate, their scroll, their vision, their strategy, and coming back down, implementing the word of the Lord. Nathaniel was the man of no guile. Jesus prophesied an open heaven. There's a last days Nathaniel company that will operate in an open heaven, and we will go up and get our stuff. Even Daniel said many will go here and there, and revelation knowledge will increase. So uh, stairway. Uh, who's from Stairway? There's a, uh, uh, ha have you read this yet, Kimberly? Okay. Um, there are three sources of transformation in our life. There are three sources. Revelation, power, and love. Those are the three streams that bring inner healing, whether it's cleansing stream or inner healing or deliverance or victory or marriage help. These are the three rivers of God that bring transformation to the human soul. Revelation, power, and love. I'm here to basically share on revelation because I feel like the church uh, is somewhat, uh, the Western church is somewhat lacking in the spirit of revelation. We have a know-it-all mentality because we have money and education. We tend to believe that we, we exaggerate our spirituality. And we tend to believe in the Western church because we've had years of Bible teaching, commentaries written, seminars, churches, courses, etc., that we know it all. And if you'll be willing to unlearn some things with me today, the revelation of the Holy Spirit will transform you. It will change you. God wants you to be so full of revelation, your eyes are like dove's eyes. Song of songs. He doesn't say you have buzzard eyes, you have turtle eyes, you have lizard eyes, you have snake eyes, you have kangaroo eyes. What did he say? You have dove's eyes. Is there any other entity or person in, in the Bible that is equated to a dove? 
the Holy Spirit. You are spiritually receiving revelation. You have dove's eyes, the eyes of a dove. The bride of Christ will have bright, brilliant, lovely eyes, the eyes of a dove. This is why he says in Song of Songs, turn your eyes from me, I can't take it anymore. I can't resist the passion of these eyes that I adore. There's something about the eyes of the bride because she is receiving revelation. Now, <clears throat> let me real quickly give you, I shared this last night uh, there at uh, Destiny, wherever we were, up uh, somewhere. Uh, and I want to I share it again here because a uh, few of you uh, have ever heard of Pardis. Pardis. I see a lot of you taking notes. I, really good. I recommend that because what's going to happen in about five minutes, you're going to say, I wish I'd written some of this down. PARDIS. I'm going to go fast. PARDIS is an acronym. P-R-D-S. You should write it out. PARDIS. It's the Hebrew word. PARDIS means paradise. And the rabbinical teaching for thousands of years is that the word of God, the word of God is paradise. And when you come into the fullness of the word of God, you're entering into the glory of heaven. In other words, you'll not touch glory and the reality of God without coming through the written word. Of course, they love the Torah. They read through it throughout the year. They have daily readings in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And uh, they honor the word of God. It's amazing how the Jewish people honor and love the word of God. They're to be commended for their, their value and uh, delight in the word of God. The Psalm 1 people that delight in the scriptures, in the word of I am. So, <clears throat> Pardus then opens up paradise. And these are the four levels of biblical interpretation. There are four levels of every scripture, every book, every verse, every revelation God gives is at least on four levels. First is, is uh, Peshat, P-E-S-H-A-T. I told you I was going to go fast. P-E-S-H-A-T is the Hebrew word plain or simple. Thank God every Bible verse has a plain or simple understanding. For people like me, like you, we can read the Word of God, and it, it says what it means and means what it says, all right? Even though some may seem cryptic, it may seem cryptic at times, but there is a plain, simple meaning to every text. Hallelujah. But that's where the Western church stops. And our Bible churches, our seminaries, our Bible colleges tend to teach the Word of God on a highly literal level, which is fine, especially for babies. We need it. But ramez is the next level. R-E-M-E-Z, the Hebrew word ramez means hint. Hint. Thousands of years the rabbis have taught this, and yet there's no one in this room, I think, that even had heard about Pardus until now. Ramez means there's a hint in every verse of the Bible. When uh, Abraham offered his son Isaac on the cross, uh, on the cross, uh, on Moriah, what's the hint? Of course, we can see that post-Calvary. We can see the hint, can't we? That there's a God, a Father, who offers a Son, and it says, on the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. I mean, that whole beautiful picture of Abraham offering Isaac, what a powerful hint there is of a deeper revelation. You see how every scripture, you can peel it back. You know, the seven days of creation are the seven stages of our spiritual maturity and growth in Christ. I've written about that in Image Maker, where the first day, the second day, the third day, the land appears out of, dry, out of the water. It doesn't say God created the ground. It says he raised it up out of the water. So he raised up someone else on the third day, didn't he? Out of the waters of judgment. So you see the, the progression of our, of, our, uh, of our life in Christ. The seven days of creation are the seven stages that we go through in, the, in completing the fullness of Christ. And man's first day was a day of rest. He created on the sixth. His first day, he began with rest. Isn't that amazing? So there's a hint everywhere. And uh, Western church occasionally dabbles there. They do touch that realm, but um, not a lot. The third... There's two more. The third is drosh, D-R-A-S-H, drosh, D-R, uh, yeah, D-R-A-S-H. This is where you get midrash or midrastic teachings. If you're familiar with rabbinical Judaism, uh, midrastic teachings would be similar to what we would call exegetical uh, teaching. So uh, drosh is the Hebrew word to seek, to inquire, to study. To dig. It's to go after something. And how many of you know 
there are certain things you got to go after. Mate, I had to go after my wife. I had to go after Candace Williams to get her to marry me. I had to go after her. It took, it was work. Hallelujah. The grace of God won. Uh, but the, there's things that are worth going after, right? Relationships, intimacy, and I believe revelation. Uh, revelation is not for the superficial. Revelation is for the intimates. It's for those who, who are passionately long for it. We cannot live without fresh revelation from God. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear Him, love Him, passionately adore Him, jaw-dropping wonder and awe that come before Him and say, I know nothing, God. I'm but a child right upon my spirit, living truth. Make me the Word of God on two legs. Make me a walking holy of holies. Let me be uh, what you desire among the nations. And as we come and empty our soul before God, then He makes us. He transforms us. We have to go after it. Sadly, in what's known as the hyper grace, I don't ever call it that because I'm hyper grace, bro. I mean, to I'm totally grace. Uh, I'm not going to let them steal that, that uh, fresh revelation. But unfortunately, there is a movement underfoot that, that basically says there's nothing anybody needs to do. It's finished. It's all done. And by the grace of God, uh, if you pray fast, win the nations, you exert yourself, self-discipline, self-control, and the disciplines of the Christian life, that's religion. That's all works of flesh. And that mentality, and uh, sadly, they don't ever uh, do a whole lot with uh, all of the grace revelation they get. For some reason, it doesn't seem to filter through in gentleness of spirit and meekness of heart. So there are things that you only get with, with uh, pursuit. Still with me? Um, I'm just trying to think of an example. Um, you know, the, the, uh, <coughs> Jesus Christ is born in Bethlehem, right? That's on the Peshat level, very clear, clearly understood. On the hint, the Ramez level, well, there's a hint there. You can go in all kinds of directions. But there's, there's got to be study. We have to dig ourselves into this, and, and we've got to find out what Bethlehem, what does Bethlehem mean? See, we study it out. What does Bethlehem mean? House of bread? Yeah, bread, house of bread. But that brings me now to the fourth level, and don't let me forget to come back to this, okay? The fourth level is sod, S-O-D, the sod of God. The sod is the deepest, glorious, uh, and if you'll look up the definition of this word, it will not trouble you a bit. Mystical revelation of the word of God. The transcendence, the supernatural understanding that only Holy Spirit gives us. You don't get this from 300-year-old commentaries. Thank God for Matthew Henry. But there is revelation you do not get simply by reading a book. Only Holy Spirit can reveal it. Now, when Jesus came to me and said, I'm going to give you secrets, one of the secrets he gave me was uh, that of homonyms. Do you know what a homonym is? Anybody know? Anybody English teacher, linguist in the room that knows what a homonym is? You must have slept through an uh, English course like I did. <laughs> what is a homonym, Kimberly? Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, there are many homonyms in English, a few. There's, you know, quite a few, like red can be the color, or it past tense to read a book, read the Bible. So the only thing in common between the color red and reading a book, the only thing those two things have in common is the word pronounced red, the phonetic sound red, okay? Hebrew is nothing but homonyms. It is a homonymic language. In other words, every word God spoke and is written in the scriptures can have multiple meanings. I call it God's entertainment. I think he laughs. When we read the Bible and say, oh, you think that's all it means? <laughs> uh, you know, it's Rubik's Cube. It's God's uh, entertainment. He has embedded into the scriptures such profound revelation on multiple layers and multiple levels. Okay, a homonym. Bethlehem, Bethlehem, Bethlehem is a homonym. And what if the translators, 
what if we've been, uh, what if, no, I won't say wrong because it does mean house of bread. But bet means house, lehem means bread, but lehem is a homonym. And would you like to know the other meaning of it? And this will help you understand why the Jews were convinced Jesus was going to overthrow, the Messiah was going to overthrow Rome. Because Lehem is the Hebrew word warrior. It's the house of warriors. Isn't Bethlehem the house of David, the city of David, the greatest warrior of Israel? And throughout the history of Israel, the greatest warriors had all come out of Bethlehem. So it was known as the house of warriors, not so much the house of bread, because if you've been to Bethlehem, I have a few times, it's a hilly, rocky uh, uh, ground that is not really conducive for bread or wheat at all. But it is a house of warriors. So when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, it was a prophecy to Israel that he would be a great warrior that would overthrow the oppression. And they took the Messianic scriptures, rightly so, the prophecies of the Old Testament. But uh, it, the, he's more than a loaf of bread in a manger. All right? So homonyms. I mean, the Bible is full of homonyms. Can I give you a few? Oh, I'm over time already. Uh, let me give you one or two, and then we'll take, uh, we'll take a short break. Um, let him kiss me. Oh. Don't you like that? Song of Songs, chapter 1. Let him kiss me. Guess what? The word nashak. Nashak is kiss. Nashak. Whoa. Nashak me, baby. Nashak. But there is a, it's a homonym. Nashak means kiss. But you mates are going to like this. But it also means to take up weapons and go to war, to fight, to be prepared for battle to be a warrior. Let him prepare me for battle with the kisses of his mouth. Yeah. See, the warring that we do is out of love. It's out of intimacy. Uh, it's lovers that will win the, the triumphant battles of these last days. Mighty lovers, you're not ready for battle until you've been kissed. Some of you look like you could use it too. I mean, I mean really, come on. We'll, we're going to have to take your, your picture and put it as the cover page to the Book of Lamentations. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with you a kiss couldn't cure. Don't expect me to do it, but there's nothing wrong with you that a divine kiss wouldn't cure. And, shock. and I'm going to stay in Song of Songs one more, and then we'll take a short uh, stretch break. Uh, the word for uh, singing. The word for singing. You heard me share this last night. The word for singing is a homonym. It says the season of singing. Song of Songs 2 says the season of singing has come, right? Well, what if the translators, you see, when you translate Hebrew, you're forced to say it one way or the other, right? Well, but it's both. The Lord showed me it's the homonymic uh, structure of Hebrew is going to be the key to understanding Revelation in the last days, including the book of Revelation, which you haven't got yet, honestly. I mean, you're, you're convinced it's Antichrist and he's not even in there, not even in there. Look for Antichrist. Come back and tell me the verse because he's not there. Okay? The book of Revelation is the unveiling of who? Yeah. Why have we made it anything less than that? It's the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Guess where he is? In us. Yeah. You're the seven-sealed book. He's going to break you open. We're the trumpet. We're the bowl, jars of clay. The whole book will open up when you realize we're the clouds he's coming in. He's not coming on the clouds, bro. He's coming in the clouds. Eight times the Bible says clouds are people. So, back to singing. Singing is a homonym that also means pruning the vines. Pruning vines. Isn't it true that when we worship and sing and lift our heart to God, some of the dead flesh, dead religion, dead works, the dead... The feelings of deadness, our heart that's cold, hasn't warmed to God. But by the second song of worship, suddenly we come alive. Why? Because the season of singing, pruning the vines has come. I, I said the last, but can I go one more? Real quick, I'll, I'll make this quick. This will change your life. I, I mean this. You'll never forget this. Never. As long as you live, you will never forget what I'm going to say in the next two minutes. Absolutely change you forever. Have I got your attention? Uh, that's not American hype. The last word Jesus spoke on the cross, he did not speak in Greek. What is the last word Jesus spoke on the cross? 
you've heard me say this, haven't you? Okay, you know what's coming, sweetheart. Oh, this does it change your life? Oh, this will, this will. I just got an email on my. I could show you on my phone. Uh, women's prison is being re revivals hitting a women's prison because of what I'm about to share with you. The last word Jesus spoke on the cross, he spoke in Aramaic. The language of Jesus was not Greek. He spoke Aramaic. I'm not going to make the point. You're going to have to search it out, and you, you come to your own conclusion. But uh, Jesus taught the Lord's Prayer, Sermon on the Mount. The teachings of Jesus were all in Aramaic, not Greek. All right? So the last word Jesus spoke, a dying man is going to speak from his heart, his heart language. I speak a number of languages, but when I want to speak to my wife or I share my heart, it's English. Jesus spoke Aramaic. The last word on the cross was kala. Kala. Kala is an Aramaic homonym, which means finished. But what if for 2,000 years the church has been robbed of uh, what Jesus really said, his dying breath? Kala. When you come to Israel with me, 2017, I'm going to do a tour. Passion Translation Tour, Thou Shalt Come to Israel with me and my wife. And I'm going to lead a tour. I'm going to fill a bus with Aussies because you're fun. I get tired of boring Americans. All, oh, man. you got to come. Bring your Vegemite, your Tim Tams, and come. All right? Yeah. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. Come on. You can do it. All right. If I ask any Hebrew speaker, even to this very day, Aramaic and Hebrew linguistically linked, it's the same in Aramaic or Hebrew. The word kala, do you want to know what it means? Are you sitting down? It's the Hebrew word bride. Bride! Then he gave birth to her. Because from his side came blood and water, mom. Blood and water. He gave birth. How can he be the everlasting father of Isaiah 9 and not have children? Bride. To be continued.